Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at HK's Grey Room in Ashburn, Virginia, where we're taking a look at some of their particularly interesting firearms. And specifically today, we're going to look at the gun that became the, uh, the Mark 23 Mod Zero in service with the US Navy and US Special Operations Command. This began in 1991 as the Offensive Handgun Weapons System Program, or Offensive Handgun Weapons Program. Uh, basically, the relatively newly formed, in the 1986, I believe, uh, US Special Operations Command wanted to standardize on a one sidearm system. So, uh, of course, the US military had adopted the 9mm Beretta, the Beretta 92, um, shortly before this in the 80s. And Prior to that, of course, the US military had 1911s. And when Special Operations Command went through and looked at what their various units were using for sidearms, they came up with this just kind of bewildering, bewildering array of different guns, platforms, ammo, magazines, systems, kind of a logistical nightmare. And they wanted to just compile this all down into one ideal, what they considered an offensive handgun. So the idea with this was in a generalized military setting, a handgun is considered a last-ditch backup defensive weapon. Uh, you know, the, the guy who has... Well, pilots carry handguns. Officers will carry a handgun as well as their, their main weapon. It's, it's a backup. However, with a special forces type of mission profile, there would be a lot of conceivable circumstances where the handgun would be the primary weapon, either because something happened to the other, a different primary weapon, a machine gun or a rifle, conceivably even ran out of ammunition. You're on a long mission, you can only carry so much with you. What happens when you run out? You don't want to be stuck with, you know, a J-frame revolver. And of course there are situations where maybe there was no other standard weapon being carried. So uh, SOCOM wanted an offensive handgun. So they set out a whole slew of requirements. Um, limitations on size, couldn't be more than 250 millimeters long for the gun and 400 millimeters long with a suppressor. That's about 12 inches and 16 inches. Uh, had to be 45 caliber. That was actually a big part of this. They looked at the cartridge effectiveness and they decided 45 gave them a lot better options than 9mm did. And specifically, this was a gun that was going to be primarily used with 185 grain plus P 45 caliber ammunition. So we're talking something a little bit different than the standard original 230 grain ball ammo. Uh, and this also meant well, that plus P designation on there means 10% over the standard maximum pressure. And this, this was a big part of the reason why they weren't looking for an upgraded 1911. The 1911 frame just isn't really built to handle that type of, of pressure and continuous usage. And this is largely why we saw problems with 10mm 1911s, and SOCOM just wanted to avoid that entirely. So they wanted a 45 caliber pistol. It had to have at least a 10-round magazine. It had to have a whole bunch of different safety options. It had to be able to be both decocked and carried cocked and locked. Um, initially they wanted you to be able to... Of course, you had to be able to mount a suppressor. That was a big part of it. But they also wanted you to be able to lock the slide so that the gun wouldn't cycle. Basically turn it into a manually operated pistol, because uh, with a, a good pistol suppressor, the like the major, the primary source of noise when firing is now, once you have a suppressor, the sound of the action slamming back and forth. If you think about it, it's the same amount of noise as you would get dry cycling the gun. And in the absence of a gunshot, that's relatively loud. So they wanted you to be able to lock the slide so you can really make it a very quiet pistol to shoot. Had to be able to incorporate an, a visible and infrared both light source and laser aiming module. And then, of course, it also had to be reliable and durable to standards that were really pretty excruciating. So uh, phase one of this program began in the middle of 1991. And that was basically where SOCOM uh, opened this up to the industry and investigated uh, options that were provided to them. You know, companies could submit pistols, and SOCOM would look at them and, and consider if they seemed appropriate or not. And then the winners of phase one were, uh, were companies that had something that looked like it showed promise. And those companies were given paid development contracts. So this wasn't something that SOCOM and the Navy, the US Navy, expected a company to foot the bill for. They were willing to pay for the development work that would go into this pistol. By the end of phase one, however, there were only two companies that 
actually met the requirements and had something that even looked like it could be compatible. One was Colt. And if you're interested in Colt's design, I have a video on the Colt Offensive Combat Weapons System, um, which I will link to at the end of this video, or you can just search for. Uh, take a look at that if you want to know more about the Colt entry. HK really kind of had a leg up on this, because they were already well into development of a new polymer-framed service pistol, and they had initially done its development in 40 Smith & Wesson, which is a substantially more uh, mechanically difficult cartridge to work with than 9mm. Uh, you're, you're working with more force and more pressure in 40 than you are in 9. So developing the system around 40 gave them a very good platform from which to, uh, to change over to 45 ACP to meet this SOCOM requirement. So HK and Colt ended up being the only two companies that would go forward. Uh, HK delivered its first batch of 30 pistols for the Phase 2 program of the trial in 1993. And from there they would go through a, a just really pretty excruciating endurance test, a 30,000 round endurance test, which the gun passed with apparently no parts breakage and still meeting the rather stringent accuracy requirement at the end, which is really very remarkable. Uh, the Colt entry, by the way, didn't make it through Phase 2. It failed those tests. There was then a, a last Phase 3 of the project where there were a couple of modifications that were requested to the gun. Basically whatever they found in that initial testing that they wanted tweaked or changed or fixed. Uh, HK would then fix that. They would go through one more uh, iteration of testing and then procurement. So I'm sorry, I think I'm getting these a little bit ahead of myself here. Phase 1 was the first endurance test. Phase 2 was the second set of testing. And Phase 3 was the final pistol, which was procured. So we actually have here a Phase 1 uh, HK pistol, a Phase 2 HK pistol, and the Phase 3, the final procured version of the gun. So let's go ahead and take a look at those up close. We'll start here with the Phase 1 pistol. So this is the very first uh, or an exemplar of the very first batch that HK delivered to the Navy uh, for assessment and testing. And this is a freaking huge gun. Um, people have complained about that a lot in what I've read about the, uh, the Mark 23. But I think it's important to remember that this really is kind of part of the purpose of the gun. It's not supposed to be a concealable gun. It's not supposed to be a compact gun. It's supposed to be a large, easily controllable, high capacity, and, and multi-purpose, without one of those purposes being concealment, uh, firearm. Intended to be capable of being a, a, a soldier, a fighter, an operator's sole weapon. So just for comparison's sake, here is a standard 9mm USP, which is really pretty much service pistol sized. And this thing really kind of dwarfs it. We'll go ahead and start with some of the elements of the gun. Uh, it is marked US Government Caliber 45. And the grip simply says HK45. Serial number on this is simply number 5. That 23 is a, a suffix, or a prefix, denoting the, the type of pistol. So this is uh, Phase 1 prototype number 5. Now our controls here include a decocking lever and a safety. Uh, you are able to carry this cocked and locked. And by the way, the, the SOCOM requirement also was very specific that uh, the downward position had to be the fire position. So swipe the, the, the safety down to make the gun ready to fire. Uh, you had to not be able to decock the pistol while it was in safe mode. So if you wanted to carry it cocked and locked, there was no chance of accidentally decocking it. Once it's on fire, then you can decock the system using this lever. The safety is ambidextrous, although the decocker is not. The magazine release is also ambidextrous. This is the same system that HK started using in their uh, P P7 series of pistols, where you push this lever down and it pops the magazine out. This was a 12 round magazine. The, uh, the requirement, the, the Navy requirement was 10. HK did one better, well, two better, I suppose, by making it a 12 round magazine. These early pistols had uh, vertical uh, striation on both the front and back strap of the grip. That would change, but we'll get to that in the next variation. And then there is this little switch in the front of the trigger guard, and that is the slide lock. You can see the, uh, the little cutout right there. If I pull the slide just slightly back, I can lift this switch up. 
That engages this little block, which locks the slide, makes it impossible to move the slide, but it can still be fired. And that's, of course, for maximum, well, minimum noise when you're firing with a suppressor. Speaking of which, the suppressor on this first pattern of gun was uh, an HK proprietary design. They came up with this thing. Um, and it's an interesting kind of unorthodox suppressor. So it's threaded on. Take it off here. Once you take this off, we can then take off this locking collar. And then you will see that we have kind of a typical suppressor sort of design underneath. And this is just an extra additional uh, expansion chamber. So this is going to reduce the noise signature of the suppressor by just a little bit more. Notice we have this little two-toothed thing, plate, on the front of this uh, extra piece. And this ring on the front. The idea there is that once you tighten this thing onto the gun, you don't know exactly what orientation this expansion chamber is going to end up in. So by loosening this locking collar up, you can put this on the gun and then rotate it into the proper vertical orientation. And then lock this collar down to hold it in place. Now this didn't prove to be a particularly effective suppressor. And one of the problems with this is that the pistol is a typical Browning type tilting barrel. And when you hang a big weight on the end of it, that tends to impact its reliability. And as, well, Colt actually kind of did a better job on this than HK did at the beginning, because what they did was contract this out to Knight's Armament, uh, who designed a suppressor that was really better suited for it. And so we'll see that in the Phase 2 gun in a minute. Before we get there, though, uh, one last thing to point out on the pistol. The Phase 1 gun had, had uh, front uh, gripping serrations on the slide. That will also change over time. And then there's this giant laser aiming module device thing. So uh, this is set up to be multifunction. It has both an illumination uh, lamp and a pair of lasers. This can be set to either visible light or infrared, and you have both an infrared and a visible laser. So you can use this for illumination and for targeting both uh, you know, with the naked eye and with uh, image intensification or night vision goggles. Put our suppressor back on. Yeah, you'll notice right there, that's, um, that's not really how you want the suppressor to stay. So let me go ahead and open this up. And I can pull that back, and I can line it up there, nice and vertical, tighten that back down, and there we go. Now we're good to go. Note that the, uh, the line of the iron sights, these don't look like they're particularly tall sights. However, they do clear the suppressor, so you don't need any special adjustment to your iron sights to use the suppressor. Uh, and that's probably part of why HK added this expansion chamber below. They couldn't make the suppressor any larger in diameter than it currently was without interfering with the sights, but they needed more volume, so they added it uh, under, under the existing suppressor. Now, the Phase 1 pistol went very nicely. It passed a 30,000 round insane endurance test. But there were a few things that needed to be changed. The suppressor, for one, and this laser aiming module needed to change. But in Phase 2, they actually didn't worry about this. They'd come back to that uh, with the the final procurement. Um, and HK wouldn't actually be building the final uh, aiming module itself anyway. So that would be subcontracted out to InSight Technologies. At any rate, um, they made a few changes to the gun and a big change to the suppressor. In addition to getting rid of that weird extra block underneath and just making the whole thing a little bit longer, they also added these springs. And this is there to improve reliability of the pistol with the suppressor attached. So again, because this is a browning tilting barrel type of action, you can see the barrel drops down there, you've got this big weight hanging on the end of the barrel that's going to really mess up the, the balance and the harmonics of this thing trying to cycle properly. So what they did, um, and I believe this is actually this actually came from uh, Knight's Armament. I believe this is a Knight's uh, Knight's production suppressor, although it's not the final version. Uh, they added basically a little gas, um, a gas trap chamber, sort of, um, and these springs, so that when you fire, 
this can actually slide forward. This one's there we go. This one's a little bit stiff and sticky, but uh, the net effect was basically uh, the the gas coming out the muzzle would give a boost backwards to help tip the barrel and cycle the pistol. And this made a big difference in reliability of the gun with the suppressor attached. It was a much better system. In addition to that, they changed the relatively uh, shallow uh, vertical striations on the grip to really heavy duty checkering here on both the front and the back strap. That slide locking functionality, that's gone. Someone realized, you know what, this really isn't a big deal. Uh, just, just get rid of that. So as of phase two, that was gone. They also extended the bottom of the magazine well slightly uh, to give it a little bit of beveling. So the magazines kind of changed just slightly as well. This is a, let's see if we can get these where you can see them. Uh, this is a phase two magazine. You'll notice there's this stepped section to the base plate. This is a phase one magazine. So the phase one magazine doesn't go far enough into the phase two gun to lock. And if we take the phase two magazine and we put it into the phase one gun, you can see there it, it locks with a little bit of extra space. So that was done to make reloading a little bit a uh, little bit faster and a little bit more, more sure. They also added a new finish to the slide. So the, the frame here is polymer. The slide is steel, all steel, one, milled from one big block of steel. And it's and this is kind of funny to me. Uh, so some people will think that, oh boy, here we go. It, some, there's got to be something French involved with every gun, right? Well, in this case, what the Germans, what HK ended up doing, was uh, coming up with a system of parkerizing the slide and then coating it in a black lacquer paint. That is what they found to be the best, uh, best combination for environmental resistance. One of the tests that this Phase II gun would go through was a 96-hour saltwater and sand immersion test. They were shaking these guns up underwater in saltwater with sand for 96 hours, so what, four straight days uh, before test firing them. And that is an extremely difficult test to pass. That's a really harrowing test. So the fact that this is the system that, the, the Finnish system that HK came up with really says something. And it's also the same system that the French came up with for their rifles in the 30s. Uh, the French had been looking for uh, what can we? What can they do to give their guns the best durability in particularly the hot and humid climates of Indochina? And they ended up settling on parkerizing, topped with a, a railroad locomotive grade black lacquer paint. So almost the exact same thing, which is a, a cool historical connection there. This Phase Two gun is still marked U.S. Government caliber 45. This is now serial number 42. The grips are still just marked HK 45. And now we come to the final iteration. This is the Phase 3 pistol, and this is the final version that was actually procured in quantity by the US Navy and US Special Operations Command. So there are a couple more changes that were made. Uh, you can see the front gripping uh, serrations on the slide have been deleted. They're just gone. They're not necessary. You're not really gripping the slide up here anyway, especially if you've got that aiming module on there. So gone. Uh, most of the rest of the gun pretty much stayed the same. The checkering stayed the same on the grips. Uh, what we see more here is a final, uh, final development on the suppressor and the aiming module. The suppressor that was ultimately adopted and used was a Knight's Armament uh, design. And it's got that same reciprocating functionality to it that the Phase II suppressor had, although this is far smoother um, and, and better to use. The laser aiming module is a far cry from the gigantic bulky thing that started out in Phase 1. Uh, this is made by InSight, um, and it maintains the same basic functionality. It's a visible light, an infrared light, a visible laser, and an infrared laser. So uh, you can use that laser for aiming both at night and during the day, or with and without uh, night vision equipment. And you can also use it for illumination with or without night vision equipment. In fact, there's your, uh, your little control stick. So visible illumination, visible laser, off, uh, infrared illumination, and infrared laser, and off. And with final procurement, the slide markings changed to HK, and then Mark 23 US SOCOM, 
caliber 45. And we now have serial number 2085 here. So this was probably after the final batch of pistols, or, or at the very end of the batch. Same marking on the grips, uh, maintained the whole way through, HK45. This, this wheel here, by the way, is the retention system. That locks into a threaded hole in the front of the trigger guard. So if we unscrew this, we can... There we go. We can slide the whole aiming module off the gun and get rid of it. Interesting to note that this isn't actually quite a Picatinny rail, because there's no cross-hatching on here. If we go ahead and disassemble this, there are a couple interesting mechanical features inside. Let's take the suppressor off first to simplify things. There we go. Disassembly is pretty typical of a Browning-style pistol. We're going to pull the slide back until that. Get rid of the magazine too. Uh, pull the slide back to here, right about there. Then we can pop out the slide stop. Come on. There we go. Then slide comes off the front of the frame. We have a pretty typical hammer-fired fire control system here. Not a whole lot to get into there. And a basically all polymer uh, frame assembly with a couple little metal inserts uh, here. The more interesting bit to me is the recoil spring system. In order to get the required endurance lifespan of 30,000 rounds, one of the main things you have to do is reduce the battering of the slide on the frame every time the gun cycles. And that largely comes down to a function of the recoil spring. So if we take this out, uh, it is captive here on the first iteration guns, uh, the first phase guns, it actually was not captive. But also note that there is, first off, this is a pretty big chunky recoil spring. And then there's an additional buffer spring at the back end. So this is going to cycle down like this. And once it's compressed all the way, you then have an additional spring uh, to, to further decelerate the slide before it impacts on the back end of the frame. So that, I think, is a really key part of what made this gun so successful. Of course, we can pull the barrel out. The barrel is chrome-lined uh, for, for a better, better lifespan, uh, corrosion protection. Uh, it does use pol HK's polygonal rifling. So you can see some rifling in there, but nothing sharp. That's not because the rifling is worn out. It's because uh, that's how it looks from the very beginning. And then, of course, you'll notice it has this weird green thing. That is actually a carefully formulated rubber O-ring. And its purpose is to center the barrel in the slide exactly the same way with every shot. This is their equivalent, or their replacement, for a barrel bushing. And it was there to, uh, to make the guns more accurate. Uh, there was a pretty strict accuracy requirement for these pistols alongside the, the, the longevity requirement. And uh, that's how they did it. So this little O-ring has a lifespan of 20,000 rounds, which isn't quite that of the entire pistol, but still really quite impressive. You can see here at the front, there is no separate barrel bushing. That O-ring just sits right there inside that front portion of the slide when the gun's locked up and in battery. And uh, it's a, a very simple mechanical principle, but that will very effectively center the barrel precisely for each shot. The locking surface is right here on the, the front of the chamber. That locks into the back of the slide surface, so no need to cut locking lugs in this area uh, like a 1911. The back end here with the firing pin there is really yeah, you know, pretty, pretty orthodox and typical. Not really anything special we need to look at there. This project, having started in 1991, ended in 1996 with the successful delivery of 1,950 Mark 23 Mod Zero pistol systems, complete with suppressor and laser aiming module, uh, to the US Special Forces Command, or Special Operations Command. At the same time, HK also released this pistol onto the commercial market as the HK Mark 23 and that's what you see here, uh, where um, it met with actually some commercial success. It is an expensive pistol, it's a huge pistol, but it is a pistol that because of its special forces 
uh, connections and actual adopted use by various uh, high-speed, low-drag elements of the U.S. military. Uh, it was a pistol that had a lot of interest from a lot of, uh, well, from the U.S. Uh, consumer market. So they released these, and these are still actually out there and available. And overall, as far as I can tell, it was a very successful program for HK. They certainly developed one of uh, a pistol that went through one of the most stringent sets of durability and endurance and reliability testing that I've ever read about. So really uh, a pretty cool accomplishment, especially all within just a, a five-year envelope. So by the way, Colt to this day has still never produced a pistol that would meet the initial, really the initial requirements of, uh, of this program, much less the pass all of the durability testing. So, anyway, um, I'd like to give a big thanks to HK for giving me access to the Grey Room, uh, where I can bring you the actual, all three different phases of the uh, prototype, the experimental pistols. So hopefully you enjoy the video. Thank you very much for watching.